Hello, welcome back everyone. This is Masters Tour Yon Chiping Online and we are getting ready to kick off our round number six of the Swiss over the course of this weekend. It's the first round of today, but obviously we had five rounds kicking off yesterday and we are going to have a Give Please versus a Felcane starting with our first match of the day, double warrior bands, mirror matches across the board, potentially Gia. Uh, but, but what do you like about these lineups? Is there anything that sticks out? Are you a fan of the Rogue and Druid approach? Definitely a fan of Druid and Rogue. I'm coming around to it, even though I didn't quite have my eyes on it as a deck that should be on everybody's radar going into this weekend. However, it seems like the questing adventure builds really help people get that extra punch that Rogue was lacking in previous builds, at least in the mid game. Give Please, a player that's currently 5-0 and in Swiss and is also one of the top contenders in APAC, I think has a really good shot of making it to Grand Masters if he continues his performance. He had two... Uh, um, pretty good performances in the previous Masters Tours this year with a total prize earning of, I think, around $5,500. And so he's been consistent so far. Yeah, and he's also uh, taken down a GM already in this tournament as he faced Zim a little bit earlier on and, and beat him 3-2. and two. So uh, not, not a bad start there. But Falcane, uh, current GM, of course, in the European region. And it looks like Falcane, although is running the Rogue, is actually running the Double Frozen Shadow Weaver and no Questing Adventures in his list. But looking at that, plus the Spy Mistress in his Rogue as well as a 2 of, uh, and the way his Demon Hunters built with that Blowtorch brother. Saboteur, it really looks like Falcane is aiming his lineup at Demon Hunter almost specifically. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And you might see some extra tech in his Druid as well. The double claw in there can be quite helpful against Demon Hunter. And so it will just be, however, him first playing Demon Hunter up against Give Please. Great for Falcane, and he's run into a pretty great opening hand. Yep, looking good to me. That sidekick going to be fantastic. Just pushing. I mean, sidekick's always good in, in pretty much every matchup. But again, the fact that it just specifically pushes the minions out of just a raw wrath or a bog beam, uh, you know, just straight up killing them is actually really huge. It means, okay, does do they need Moonfire as well? Suddenly they need two removal tools this early in the game to kill just one minion. It's really, really nice. Yeah, it is a huge deal, just that extra health and durability on the battlefield because the early game plan for Druid is try and stave off that pressure until they can get to either Glowfly or the Mount Cellar. We saw from Give Please's hand, he already has the wild growth into Glowfly Curve, but he probably won't get all that many flies uh, given that he had to expend a spell last turn, right. probably going to grow with again and has not hit Fungal Fortunes. I was. I just took a quick glance at Innovate Coin, but again, just without the Fungal Fortunes, it just does not make enough minions. And if that's your turn and it gets swept up by Demon Hunter easily, that those are the games you instantly lose. Uh, but here for Felcane, his opening is just getting better and better. Not only did he have the great early game, but now he has the, the choice of, okay, not next turn without a Twin Slice off the top, but the Gladebound Adept Warglaive choice in the mid game going turn five and six is absolutely huge, especially against Druid because there's the Glowfly I'm and there's the one card answer. Trying to count if there's lethal already because this <laughs> Battle Fian can go up to plus four attack this turn. It's not quite there, I think, but it is awfully close. And even if it's not lethal this turn, okay, it's just a concede anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do see the hand of Give Please just uh, going a little bit quicker than we saw it on uh, Felkine's side of the board. But in what must be at least close to record time, we have game <laughs> one already done. Just an instant concede. And... Uh, there was a, a match with Firebat, I recall, a few years ago that may have actually been quicker than that, but still, that was fast. Uh, and I will say, although that might have looked a little bit weird from Give Please's side, saying, well, he just conceded he wasn't dead, he pretty much was, right? Was. You, you <laughs> play the matchup enough, you know the answers, and as I mentioned, Felcane built the board early, job one done, and then had the Warglaives to clear off the Glowfly, and that means that there's just there's not enough time, there's not enough mana for uh, Give Please on his Druid to do anything. So 
honestly, quite rightly, I think he's just conceded. Saves just sticking around in a game that little bit longer that he knows he, he's going to lose. Yeah, uh, Give Please didn't have any outs there. He would be facing down an even bigger board than the last turn, and only a fraction of the health he had was still far off from the seven mana to really, truly go off with the Mount Seller. So he knew it was impossible, and that is generally the story of how that matchup goes. If Druid either doesn't hit amazing removal into over into overgrowth into either mount seller or overflow or say early as turn three glowfly with the fungal fortunes plus innervate dream i feel like they don't have very many outs there's also right. the possibility of demon hunter whiffing a little bit but as you saw falcon had pretty much the best possible opener and now we're going to a matchup which is definitely a lot more back and forth the rogue from falcon which is tech versus demon hunter can't wait to see how it pans out yeah, this is quickly becoming my, or at least one of my favorite matchups in this meta, especially since the, the Spy Mistress tech, I'll say, has started becoming much more commonplace in this list. Uh, because this isn't just the secret package. Uh, sorry, this is the secret package with Spy Mistress. It's not the stealth package. Right. But I think this is uh, pretty good. It doesn't have the questions here from Felcane, but he is running double Shadow Weaver. So again, I guess if you're not going to run questions uh, and you want to target Demon Hunter, well, Shadow Weaver gets the job done, doesn't it? So I can't argue too much. But you can see the power already of the Spy Mistress, this Battle Fiend, or we can see this uh, Bone Truer Brawler. He's just going to die. And yeah. there's just not a lot not a lot give please can do about it, right? One of his minions is just going to die. Spy Mistress is just a preloaded removal spell which you can use on turn one, which a lot of the time rogue skips unless they draw a Pharaoh Cad. And Falcane's opener is amazing once again, both of the seal fates for him to use as removal back to back. And give please trying to get extra damage in already using a twin slice because he has two in hand just to buff up his uh, Battle Fiend a little bit more. He's going to get the bad news though that Felcane has great removal options. It was interesting at the beginning that Give Please uh, tossed his Beaming Sidekick away. I tend to think that's a pretty useful card in any matchup where you're trying to essentially preserve your early minions and run away with that lead. But without having a one drop on top of it, I can understand why he prioritized mm. trying to get that Battle Fiend in the first place. Yeah, I, I think you know, in different matchups, just playing a Sidekick on one is fine. Uh, but I think against Rogue specifically, they have so many answers to just a one, you know, a one-two that does nothing else for the rest of the game, uh, and it maybe is it too much of a valid target for Seal Fate, Backstab, and so on. I think it was right in this matchup to throw that. But normally, I am a fan of actually. Well, if you have a sidekick and you end up with it, just, just play it out on one and get going. So for Falcon, I was actually expecting a Seal Fate because um, should the Battle Fiend get damaged this turn, if it maybe takes a value trade you maybe don't get to deal with it but of course if uh the turn is removal and then give please doesn't develop then suddenly felcane's turn is seal fate face which feels really bad so i think he took a more uh safe approach getting down the miscreant right. while the combo was active this early and now give please's draw is pretty decent he can redevelop yeah and uh, i do like the miscreant play again in in, in this matchup you almost have no bad lackey outcomes. There's a couple, but generally, uh, Titanic lackey, good on the miscreant to help fend off some, some aggressive push. Cobalt lackey, kills pretty much any demon hunter minion, at least at this point in the game. And then even the goblin rush lackey to make the miscreant trade up a little bit better. And then the witchy lackey to, you know, maybe just poke in and then uh, evolve it. There's so many good outcomes. It's kind of hard to, to whiff on that miscreant. So that's why I do like it. And of course, as you said, they want to get locked in to just throw in seal fates out if he can. I think you make a good point about the average quality of lackeys. There are a lot that immediately impact the board. The thing with Titanic and Witchy is that you rely on a minion having to stick this turn. And uh, you can't always rely on that versus Demon Hunter, but I think Felcane found a spot where it was right. very awkward for Give Please to get rid of a 1-4, and even if he did remove it, he had Pharaoh Cat to possibly use with the Lackeys, and got a great result there with a the Kobold, gets a fully clean board, and Give Please's hand is as cheap as you might see from pre oh. previous iterations of Rogue. <laughs> and and this, is, this really is, and you might notice, uh, me and Sol in the European Grandmasters have getting uh, have been getting pretty hyped over Spy Mistress, honestly. But this is one of the things that Spy Mistress unlocks, right? Like suddenly, this early in the game, with the help of it, that that Felkane's just 
just in control. Yes, Give Please hasn't had the ultimate draw, but he by no means had a bad draw in, in the early game. But Belkin on this rogue has managed to just handle this pretty easily, actually. Very cleanly. And for Give Please, you saw him already expending a charge face when he could have just used the weapon to get rid of the Cobalt Lackey. You can already see his game plan. He's trying to send as much damage face as possible because he realized that he didn't have a good enough opener to stave off what Felkane had to rely on board control. So now he's trying to ship extra damage face. And unfortunately for him, Felkane has an extremely good answer. Ancestral Guardian and Rush just heals for another five. Yeah. Uh oh my. This only ever looks okay for the Demon Hunter in two ways. They either have Skull on Curve, in which, you know, you can make anything happen with that draw, or the Rogue has done well at fending off the aggression, but has used all of their resources to do so. Falcon's hand is nearly full. Andy's winning board. <laughs> like, th this well, shouldn't be allowed. And he gets a Neither great two this. drop. Oh my. <laughs> Yeah, I was looking at the Guardian there to give him heal, but it makes sense actually to instead put the pressure on Give Please. This is a 6-6 six, six Edwin, even if he didn't get that good of an outcome from his Faceless Lack. He could have rushed something else and still traded off the Glaive Bound. And he's not giving Give Please the time to draw into more of his um, damage spells. Felkane is trying to race here rather than healing when it's not necessary yet. Oh, I see his weakness. All off the top. Pretty much give Please's only way of even having a chance here, but it still looks pretty awful. It looks bad, but he does have another Skull as well, which is 100% castable next turn. Uh, worst case with that Shadow Caster uh, on, on the on the side. Shadow Weaver, sorry. Um, but again, the problem is, for, for give Please's Felkane's just got tons of stuff to do. And it's... It's the positive and negative, I guess, of Demon Hunter at the moment. Because the deck is so predictable, what it does is very powerful, but it kind of does the same thing every single game, right? It doesn't generate tons of cards to make these weird games play out. It does the same thing. And because of that, Felke knows, as you mentioned quite rightly, doesn't have to heal yet. He's not taking 16 from hand. Uh, not a chance. So he could just sit on that uh, ancient uh, Ancestral Guardian, sorry, whenever he wants. And maybe even just taunt it up whenever he's got some spare mana. Doesn't look like he'll even need to heal. He is just racing. No. Give Please got a great outcome in the Vendetta. Essentially just a backstab here, but Give Please now knows that the Reborn minion is also of a class that isn't rogue and not neutral. Um, he is relying on the Skull to give him, I think, the only out of a big altruist swing. Okay. Well, <laughs> yep. We're getting there. Managed to at least freeze Edwin for oh. now. But it looks like there's not enough uh, procs for Altruist currently in hand to actually kill the Edwin. As if Felkane chooses to kill off this Shadow Weave, I imagine he will, because again, Felkane will know, right? What are the problems here? What are the outs? Altruis, or I guess. Not even like Metamorphosis Kane is going to do it because it would cost. Right. It would be very difficult to pull off. But if Altrius is the problem, do you keep your one massive health minion having the highest chance at staying up and staying alive. So I like what Felkane did there. Like it as this well. Is still a decent turn from Giv. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great for him that at least if he doesn't have a way to clear Edwin, he has. Sorry, with the eye beam now he has a way to clear the Edwin yep. without having to freeze it, and that is huge. Can even buff up the Altruist outside of the range of the Cobalt Lackey or just seal fate. And now Falcon is suddenly on the back foot. I love watching Falcon's camera. It's been a true highlight for me casting European Grandmasters because oh, yeah. uh, he is very honest with his with his reactions on camera. And honestly, I don't blame him being potentially a bit upset with this one because he looked like he was in such control. This needed, uh, if you can recall, not too long ago, Give Please had two very... He had Skull off the top into another Skull, which then got him the big Altrius turn, which was huge, obviously. And that is probably the only thing that could have cleaned up this board and gave him a chance. And he was looking for 
a, at least a free secret there to be able to play the blackjack stunner. You realize that uh, just taking the whole turn for removal probably wasn't enough because Gev Please has a lot of out uh, top decks for even more damage. So Falcane felt like he needed to get the armor. Doesn't unfortunately come up with a way to clear the altruist, but at least for Falcane, Gev Please is on a single draw. Okay, one more so AoE. Nine, right? Yeah. Keeps him alive one more turn. If Falcon can pick up another way to get Rush Lackey, he still has that Ancestral Guardian, which he can put into the Altruist, gain back some life. But even if that happens, he needs to get rid of the rest of the board. Okay. You could get two Rush Lackeys, right? Hero Power Seal Fate? Uh, then he won't have mana Oh, I wouldn't play. have enough, yeah. yeah. Oh, nothing's reduced, is it? Mm -hmm. I mean, wow, he what just happened can't this game? win by clearing the board here. So I feel like he has to look for the Rush Lackey to get healing. Um, he could get Ice Barrier from this. Explosive is a start, and then he could still fish for Ice Barrier. It wouldn't matter though, right? Because unless he kills the Altrius, he then Give Please just yeah. plays whatever card he has. Uh, Falcon just trades into it though. I mean, he is just hunting. Oh, sure, yeah, now. sorry. I thought, yeah, for some reason, I thought it was frozen. Yeah, you're completely right. No worries. Oh, man, he just can't hit it anymore. No mana left after he takes a two cost. Can't afford a mage secret anymore. That's going to be game, I think. Maybe hoping to bamboozle give, please, somehow. Not with the secret, but just making him overthink about this turn. But I think Give Please will quickly well, realize there's no secret that saves Falcane from this. Uh, a bluffed ice barrier might make him think twice, though. Yeah, he can always test, though. I guess that's the issue, okay. isn't it? He can always, because he has enough minion attacks, he can always test and still feel fairly right. safe. Uh, the only combination here that gives Give Please a lot of problems, I would say, is Ice Barrier plus Explosive Trap, which from his perspective is still possible. So if he's hedging around that exact combo, he should trade some minions into the Hanar, but I don't think you can afford to hedge around um, those two together. I think it's on average better for Give Please to play around just Ice Barrier, in which case you still send minions right. face. Um, a couple of them, though. Yeah, even if he sends the 4-2 into the 1-4, he still has 9 damage between his War Glaives, the 1-1 one, one, and the 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, and then he realizes not much to worry about there. Still, I really like the caution from Give Please. Right, and good effort from Falcon, honestly. <laughs> just because, just making sure that although it looked like it was never going to happen, he was always going to lose that game, uh, there's always a chance that with those secrets, uh, that there is a failure rate in just, it's a high pressure scenario, if you mess this up, you could lose, if you get it right, you could win. There's a chance that there might have been something gone wrong there, but to give please, as you mentioned, very correctly, just to set everything up perfectly to yeah. give him his best chance of taking that game. Pretty impressive, honestly, but that, mm -hmm. those skulls were huge. Yeah, the skulls were amazing. I mean, Falcon had solid grip on that entire game up until uh, the Altruist turn, which, you know, Altruist is in the deck because it can turn even a terrible situation for Demon Hunter into a winning situation. And you right. can never feel completely safe against Demon Hunter because of that possibility. And that's why you saw Falcon go for the Edwin earlier on instead of the Ancestral Guardian Rush to get rid of Glaivebound. He was trying to give give please the least amount of time possible to put together the altruist turn and although it didn't quite work out uh in the end i think that was super well played from both players yeah i mean bear in mind the the altruis also had to uh there was a draw into the eye beam right. which was the card that made up the difference of damage to actually kill the van cleave so just a ton of things had to go right there for give please and now i imagine uh, felcane might be feeling a little bit more uh, worried about this series because uh, as i mentioned at the start just looking at his decks he has a lot of anti aggro tech in there that looks like it's very specifically looking at demon hunter uh, but now give please got a win with his demon hunter which means he's got his rogue and druid left and although the cards will still come into uh, use 
they're not going to be as powerful than versus just a truly aggressive deck like Demon Hunter. Yeah, Demon Hunter is just insane of a deck. I think that we've seen a lot of people try and target it. We've seen people even leave it out from their lineup because they don't expect it uh, or respect it. Um, but I feel that the opportunity for Demon Hunter to sometimes, if they don't win the early board, just if they get the skulls and then sit on a big altruist turn, can blow up any early board control you have. So I feel that if you're going to be targeting Demon Hunter, you need to be running healing effects as well. And maybe that Shaman from Roof Troll, and we might see later on, could have that potential. But for now, we're going to head onwards with the series. It's Druid now. Forgive, please. Yep, and Falcon going to be on that Rogue once again. And so far, Rogue has been on the um, the losing end of the Druid matchup in this tournament, at least, with going into today only a 48% uh, win rate in that matchup. Of course, that's not uh, respective of exact builds or anything like that. Uh, but still, just on average, it looks like Druid's been getting the, the better of Rogues for now. That's right. And I would argue that the questing adventure version of Rogue probably has a slightly higher chance of winning against Druid because they can maybe blow out the early game, stick a questing that doesn't get answered, and try to kill the Druid before they get to the Mount Cellar's turn. But uh, Felcane is not running that version, as we said. He has right. the Secret package, which is not highly effective against Druid in the early game, I would say. Uh, they don't impact the board or race, and the Druid is very happy to just uh, draw their cards and ramp as usual and that is give please as exact hand yeah this is this druid hand is just the reason you you even play druid right uh, access to card draw ramp and even and this sounds this always sounds a little bit weird to say but even just already having the mount seller in hand feels good because you know you can't discard them both right like you know you're at least going to have one mount seller board especially because there's the ramp to get there so looking pretty good Forgive, please, at least in the opening hand. But Rogue has the ability to uh, flip games on its head. And I will say, although Ambush, again, not really uh, super powerful uh, in this matchup, I do think Dirty Tricks is pretty strong because it's almost guaranteed that your opponent's going to play a spell mm -hmm. almost every single turn of the game, right? Which means whenever you pay that two mana, you are going to draw cards when it goes back to your turn. Yeah, it's a really good point you bring up because Falcane's draw has been so awful. Like he got double secret and neither of them is Dirty Tricks. He's right. not even running the Bamboozle, so I'd say that's very unlucky. What's interesting to me is that Give Please chose to coin out Wild Growth and then Overgrowth, which means he's trying to turn out Mount Cellar, but he won't have payoff spells for Mount Cellar this turn, so he still ends up playing Fungal Fortunes into a stall. So I actually would have preferred to see him go Fungal, then Wild Growth, and then, uh, yes, you can Overgrowth a bit later, but you would have the coin. Uh, if he gets Glowfly off of the Fungal, <laughs> though, then <laughs> that makes it worth it. Yep. And maybe the reason for that is while he wasn't under any threat, he can just do the ramp then. And even though it's around the same sort of time, because as you said, there's a turn where he has to draw cards for the Mount Cellar. What? Oh, wow. What? Um, <laughs> oh. I'll finish my point briefly, but I guess we're going to just finish this series in a minute anyway. Um, but I think while he wasn't under much threat and there wasn't really anything to interact with on Felcane's side of the board, I think he, he must have been thinking, okay, well, I'll just ramp now and then take the turn a little bit later that might be either, yes, I'll spend my seven mana turn to draw cards, but then he can use the rest of the mana to make a Glowfly board if that's the case, sure. or at least just use maybe some more removal spells if uh, Felcane put anything forward on board. So I do actually like the way around he did that. But anyway... It's one for one now for players that have just conceded when they feel like they're in a losing spot. So uh, pretty crazy overall. But that does mean Give Please is one game away from taking the series and going six and zero in Swiss. Oh, man. Falcane, he's not even in a weird time zone for this tournament, right? E, you are the I'm ones that aren't sleepy right line. now. <laughs> oh, and he's on stream as well. But all right, I guess he just wanted to get that over with. Felt like the hand just didn't get there with two right. clunky minions and not an efficient way to deal with the glow flies. I would argue that you still take the, what would it be, 5% or less chance to win that game there. But anyway, he is going to be on the favorable side of the matchup now. Yeah, and... and... Although I 100% get behind, well, it's a tournament, you need to take even 0.1% chance at winning a game, I don't think there was a good chance because Give Please had all the ramp, 
He then drew cards, made a glowfly board, and there were still plenty of cards left in hand, and they only support the glowflies, right? Um, or make the board stay even stronger. So I think that was a reasonable concede on the Secret Fell uh, game. Oh. This might be facetious yeah, of you, but it's never zero, right? There's always a world where the double mount sellers are at the bottom, all of the savage roars are at the bottom. And it would have to I involve he, an exceptionally loses, poor though. draw for <laughs> That's what's crazy. Yeah. I think if you could name like six to seven cards that are guaranteed at the bottom of the deck, the other cards do the job, and you know, regardless. So it's pretty it, crazy. It is crazy though. It is is not something we see <laughs> see often. It's just these uh, concedes almost out of nowhere. But we are in the same matchup now, except yeah. Give Please does have, as you can see quite rightly now, are this quest and adventurers in his list that Felkane does not. And even this early, there's got to be some level oh, no. of consideration no. at when he wants to get it down. Because a lot of the time against Druid, no, I just play questings out on curve. Mm. Yes. Yes, Give Please. I like this. Make them have the removal. And a lot of the time they will, but importantly, when the Druid removes, sometimes it's at the cost of a turn they would rather have been ramping or have been drawing cards. So I also don't mind this at all from Give Please. Also, yep. his hand is rather poor. It doesn't synergize with each other very well. Nothing to prep into. So Give Please just spending his mana, I don't mind whatsoever. Oh, oh no! Oh no! So the good news for and the bad news. The good news, Claw, that I've seen so far this weekend, watching and casting Druid, seems to be pretty good, actually. It seems to get the job done every time, as it did then. Uh -huh. Bad news for Felcane. Wow, that was a bad discard, wasn't it? He lost his Mount Cellar and his Ysera, and Felcane is not running the, the Emerald Explorer hybrid package that we've seen from some other players. So he has one Mount Cellar in his deck and two Glowflies, and that's it. They're all the threats. Yep. Uh, thankfully for him, though, the first Glowfly can come down next turn for full charges. The only oh, caveat is gosh. that he would be leaving the Hanar up and possibly giving give to get an answer flame ward or explosive trap but from Felcane's perspective i don't think it means you forego a glowfly turn no. Job done. hey just to, uh, to bring you uh, your attention to this as well as we didn't really point it out but give please currently at five and zero if he takes this seriously he'll be six and zero but Felcane he actually got paired up against give please because Felcane is not five and zero which is how it normally works in swiss for most matchups uh, he's actually four and one so even if Felcane won this it would still only be five and one which would be the same score as give please if he won this match so mm -hmm. it's just pretty crazy that Felcane even has a bit more work out from here yeah, the pairing up and down, sometimes an unfortunate side quest of how... Uh, side effect, not side quest, side effect of how Swiss works out when you have an odd number of players at the same uh, score mark. For Fel Kane there, two secrets to be worried about. Paladin, not particularly impactful in my opinion. Uh, never Surrender is a consideration as to how he would want to trade. But it's really the mage secret that he'll be scared of. Flame Ward is a big one. That's the news though, that it's not. Never Surrender is very powerful, but I don't think it overly changes your plan that much, right? You can't play around it, right? Like, yes, you can do things that help with trades first and so on, but it's not right. like Felcane can say, okay, I won't cast a spell this turn. It's like, well, you hold deck spells, so enjoy. You couldn't hard play around it by not playing a spell, but as you said, maybe he could do a couple of trades differently. Right. However, there's also built-in downside. If it's not Never Surrender, suddenly you might not have enough minion attacks to get through a uh, redemption, which is what Give These did end up having. And now, the Glowflies have been staved off. Felcane, even with that overflow in hand, only has, as you said, the one Mount Cellar and the one Glowfly left as for his minion threats. Yeah, I, I think we'll see Falcane try, he might not be able to, but try and transition into landing the best soul of the forest board he possibly can. Mm -hmm. Whether that's trying to stick a strong mount cell and then putting it on top of whatever's left over in a turn's time, or it's if he gets to his second glowfly, just holding off and holding off until he can do it all in one turn, because I think without that soul of the forest, and give please obviously having 100% information, on that there is only the, the limited amount of threats left in the deck. He'll know that all he has to do is remove two, two waves of threats to win the game, really. So I think Falcane needs this Soul of the Forest to get, to get a win here. 
yes, I would agree, especially because of the threat of Blix Skyshiv, which if you don't have insurance on that board, no matter how buffed they are by Power of the Wild, for example, can all get removed at once. So I think that will be uh, top on Felcane's priority list. For now, though, he's gonna get this overflow going. You saw him use an Innervate just to put out an Eagle and empty more cards in hand in preparation. Yeah, and in this match, we saw pretty much the opposite of what happened in the previous game, mm -hmm. where Give Please did have those dirty tricks, right? He's used another one now, which again is almost against Druid, a guaranteed two cards for your next turn. Uh, so Give Please without those, although he would have had a different card, obviously, then he would be quite dry on resources, but he is getting there, honestly. Keeping his hand pretty full, and there's oh. the that's an enormous draw. Felkin already felt like he was in such a bad position having not drawn the Glow Fire second Mount quest. Seller in the five draws from the Overflow. But now the questing is not going to give him that much time to look for those cards. Right. We could see Give Please go very wide here. He could Faceless step Faceless. Um, could also see the Praise Galakrond on this Miscreant to give him another Lackey option that Perhaps it's better to step. Not the greatest two drop. Just actively taking up board space, but he can still build the questing to an enormous health total. Yeah, I think he would have loved a witchy lackey there, wouldn't he? Uh, mm -hmm. To just be able to just evolve this out and then maybe just shadow step and evolve something else as well. But regardless, I, I do love the shadow step use. I complained a little bit yesterday, uh, just generally about a piloting rogue and ended up losing games with shadow step being sat in the hand for ages which is something i uh I, it, that annoys me because <laughs> uh, i think shadow step although it can be used for insane value should be used to win games and we see felke in there miss once again on the few threats he has left and i get him being a bit a bit upset as i said he does show his emotion quite visibly on camera but to be fair he discarded two of his huge threats and yep. now he's seven cards left in the deck and he only drew one of the others. <laughs> so it's not looking great, is it? He's praying for the Mount Seller. Even a Glowfly off the top here wouldn't have been too great because it doesn't stay off the questing. You would take it though to maybe hope that you're not dead on the immediate next turn. Well, he could at least no, Glowfly, Glowfly Innovate Soul, oh, right? He could have at okay. least done that. So yeah. that would have been <laughs> something to try and win the game. He does get the Mount Seller though. But he's only got a couple of spells. Is this mounts are just going to get farmed by the questing. It's the issue, right? Might very well be. But he has to no take one. the shot. Two shots, two griffins. Are you feeling it, Raven? Either that or a whole lot of taunts. Okay, okay. Two I mean, taunts. not bad. But Give Please has Rush Lackey. He has another Shadow Step to rush another thing if he wants. Oh, if, if he already had a Rush Lackey on board, imagine. Oh, yeah. Shadow Step the Rush, play Alex Strauss and go. Oh, be an insane turn, but not quite mm. there yet. Still, yeah. looking to be very powerful for Give Please. Yeah, the two drop that he got that can attack is actively deterring him because he doesn't have that many minions that he can actively rush to take the board um, very efficiently. But even screen. these one drops will do a lot. Yeah. It's just huge. It's just got five attack for some reason. <laughs> and the good thing here is that uh, although it looks like Give Please is putting a lot into this removal, uh, into removing this board. With Alex Straza in hand, Give Please does not really have to go face at all this turn, mm -hmm. right? There's no need, right? With right. Alex next turn, he can put his opponent to 15 and then finish them with the quest in. So all Give Please, I think, wants to do right now, we might see where he puts this, but I think he should put this into Mount Cellar. Is, I agree. He's just empty the board and say, okay, you literally only have a Glowfly turn left. That does nothing. And then Al Alex just win. So I think Give Please mm -hmm. has executed this uh, turn and honestly this game uh, very well. Yep, he found the only way he could lose, which is leaving up the Mount Seller. So he decides to trade it off. Realize that this is the same problem Falcon had last turn, except there's no Mount Seller to try and get any um, Griffins left in the deck. Even a Glowfly Swarm this turn would not be enough because it's just Alex for right. lethal, as you mentioned. 
Yeah, That's gonna be succeed. GG. Gift, please, up to six and oh, very, very impressive. Yeah, really strong performance there. And of course, it was uh, it was helped in the Demon Hunter matchup. Uh, we had a little bit early on that back-to-back -back skull bailing him out of the uh, the Felcane Rogue matchup he had. Mm -hmm. So that definitely helped. But his execution was there. I think he played very, very well overall. And uh, I, I think his, his lineup's good as well. But we did see there from Felcane not only the, the rough Rogue game, which we, you know, we saw, but also... He couldn't even wild growth to draw an extra card because he pretty much outside of that wild growth had no ramp all game. And that is just one of the things I guess keeping Druid in check is that it doesn't overly consistently tick every single box, right? It, it, th there are games where you just don't have the ramp, you don't have the threats and so on. And it can leave you in a bit of a rough spot here. But again, congratulations to Give, please. Going 6-0 in Swiss so far. He's looking fantastic going into tomorrow. And Falcane there, that was his second loss. So I think even with the best tiebreakers, he can't afford to drop a single series now if he wants to make it to another top eight. Fel Falcane himself being probably the poster boy for entering the Grandmaster system with his historic win at Seoul and being a new EU GM, though I don't think he should be too sad about giving some other people a chance to promote into GM, but it was pretty rough the way that he lost uh, a couple of those games. However, I'm excited to see Give Please prove that he has what it takes later on. I had the fortune of meeting him, I think, a couple of years ago at the old HCT system where he had a pretty good performance, I believe, at HCT Taichung, and now still grinding in the new system and proving that he has what it takes to be a GM, potentially. Yeah, definitely excited to see more from him and more from all the players as well as this was only one match from one round and we have four rounds in total today and tons of Hearthstone to bring to you. So we're going to be uh, back and bringing more coverage of this round for the day. But for now, we're going to go to a quick break while we get those matches ready. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everybody, to Masters Tour. Yong Ping and that win by Give Please puts him all that bit closer to getting to Grand Masters. This is his third tournament in a row with six wins. Um, but he's done, and we're going to have a look at some other of the games from round six, along with Darek. And Darek, we have PNC, the recently relegated Grand master and one of Britain's finest players four and one does very well at all the events and very well respected it's oh, okay paradox is playing sorry <laughs> uh, but yeah what do we make of him memes aside for paradox he does take it bless him yeah well I mean uh, his big uh, claim to fame was uh, re winning the ESL series that we had here in the UK a little while ago uh, you know joining such names as Jambre and Boar Control so clearly up there with the best of the best that we have in UK Hearthstone, but hasn't quite been able to turn that around into a uh, big kind of global victory with uh, a wider field, not just UK representatives. Uh, but with a four and one start now, he's looking to be in a very good spot to do so. And even though we all love to rag on Paradox a bit, that is no secret here. He is the butt of a lot of my memes. Uh, I think he is still a very strong Hearthstone player and a deserving competitor at four and one. I agree entirely. He's his own worst enemy at times. His confidence gets really, really low. Probably because we don't help that very much, to be absolutely <laughs> fair to him. Um, but he has been at the top of the UK scene for a long time, and I think we, we should probably stop being unfair to him. He's had a lot of good results over time. He has indeed. And now, going up against PNC, uh, no slouch of an opponent for sure, but I, uh, I think it's fair to say that... Uh, the most recent year or so has not been PNC's golden era. It's not to say he's been playing especially badly at all, but if we think about how well he was doing back in the old uh, kind of ladder grinding days with the old HCT system, it's definitely time for him to put a big win on the table, show that he still is up there at the top of competitive Hearthstone. And, uh, well, drawing the, uh, the ramp and the fungal fortunes, that's a good way to show that you're a good Hearthstone player. And so for Paradox, this is the kind of uh, constant conundrum that you're put in as the Warlock, where until you can hit turn six and you can get out your summoners, or even turn five out the coin, you're kind of trying to figure out what do I actually spend my mana on? I'm full of, my hand is full, so I can't keep tapping. I don't want to play out a Moog because that's one of my premium pieces of removal. So you just dump a card. You're not happy about it, but it's really the way the matchup does tend to go. Next turn, however, is where things will get a little bit more difficult, all depending on how PNC decides to throw out these Glowfly Swarms. Because if one is just tossed down here, it makes Paradox's life very easy with just a crazed Netherwing. Um, and if that doesn't come down, then I suppose you're looking at the Coin Abyssal Summoner instead. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, and so now with the uh, Glowfly Storm and Soul of the Forest, that does make this a little bit more difficult. Hmm. Uh, but he does, in the end, just decide to go off with a Glowfly Swarm here. It's, it's a, a big risk here to go for it this early, but you've got to say at this point as well, the uh, time at which my opponent is least likely uh, to have the removal is the earliest point, but sadly it is important. Dragon and the Crazed Netherwing in hand uh, to come down for Paradox. And now for PNC, the turn would have been an awful lot more difficult, of course, without the Glowfly and Soul of the Forest. But the Mount Cellar off the top is the absolute dream here, because he can now get a big board down on this turn and a big board down on the following turn with the Glowfly plus the Soul of the Forest. Uh, I guess the only real question is how many spells does he want to dump here um, in order to still keep enough back for a big blowfly on the following turn. Sorry about that, can you hear me now? I can hear you just fine. I wonder if everyone else can know if you're talking to yourself. I guess we'll find out in a moment. <laughs> sorry about that. Alright, yeah, we're all good. Hear me. I'm sorry guys, you can hear me again. Okay. <laughs> so we'll just in time to out witness... PNC beating to Nether by a handsome turn. Yeah, this is the real benefit of getting the ramp down. It's not even so much that you uh, are doing powerful things 
or you're afraid of dying. It's just before the big removal spells come down. But even then, with Kelly Dan able to clear off most of this, it's kind of the worst of both worlds now for TNT. He threw down a Glowfly earlier. It was cleared. This Mount Cellar has been cleared, and all of a sudden his Glowfly Swarm is only making four Glowflies, which is not game-winning on its own, not by a long stretch. Yeah, especially with a hand that we can see. Mm. I mean, backing up with a soul, like you say, on its own, there's some bluffs available, but Paradox should be able to hang in there. Mm-hmm. Just trying to work out actual numbers rather than projecting. Um, so four two twos, you buff them to three, you buff them to five. Maybe it would represent lethal. Yeah, I mean, you buff oh. them to six next. Oh, no, yeah, all the way up to five is with the power of the world and the savage roids. A big deal, for sure, but with both uh, Rain of Fires gone as well, it's difficult for Paradox to actually find a proper board clear to this. And even though it's a really scrappy board for PNC, it may just about be enough to get there. Yeah, just because of what he has in his hand, as it so happens. Not, I mean, I'm not blaming PNC, but not through anything particularly planned. It's just this is how it worked out. And so now Trade Craze Netherwing leaves four Treants on the board. And then you can nether breath down to one left, which means you would be at 20 health. Oh, sorry, three left. And then at 20 health, uh, Paradox would be surviving in that instance, just about. How much do you play around? I think the sensible thing is to play around exactly one second. To be absolutely fair and so on. Looks like he's just going for the plan of ignoring the board completely, though, at least in terms of uh, clearing it off. And instead developing his own taunt? This has the advantage that if your opponent doesn't kill you next turn, you can start fighting. Okay, he's failed on the plan. I guess safety first, but the, the other route had a lot of merit as well. In uh, If your opponent doesn't have savage draws and things, then you can start clearing up boards and have things in the way. I think for me, as wow, that is a top deck off the top of PNC, and <laughs> probably, if not this turn, will come down very, very soon. Uh, but the main thing for me on Paradox's turn is that the clear is only good when your opponent has a board. The taunt is just always good in the matchup. So you want to save the... The taunt can come down any time, I feel like. This is the one specific use where you can make uh, value where there wouldn't otherwise be it. The craze Netherwing. Then you follow up with the Abyssal Summoner very, very cleanly. Okay. It's going to vanish again for a minute, I'm afraid. No worries. Uh, but Paradox, the uh, the real continuation here is just trying to find a way to pressure his opponent now in one of two ways. Obviously, minions is ideal because Druid does struggle to deal with these large minions. But now that the dragons are inevitably going to start coming, the more likely way that he will be able to get this board is just by getting the quest completed and cheating out the mother of all cheap spells. Uh, and minions, be it Twisting Nether, Dragon Queen Alexstrasza, Malagos, whatever it is, he needs those big, big cheap uh, cards, basically, off the upgraded hero power, if he wants to be able to swing this around. But before any of that can happen, PNC going off here with the buff cards, just trying to get as much damage to face as possible. Uh, unless it just has lethal on this turn and I can't count. There we go, that is 14 damage, and that's going to be game <laughs> one. Game uh, four, sorry, going to PNC. I knew all that and would obviously have told you and would never have missed it in a million years had I been here. Oh, well, obviously, Neil. That's uh, what we both expect from you, of course. But with that being a, a slightly rocky first game, uh, I think that uh, Paradox kind of did everything he could to fight back against that. But it's just an instance of where the Druid has all the ramp as well as a lot of the threats. And there's little a lot to do in that instance. Yeah, and we are going to go into this super important Game 5. The loser is all but out of the tournament. There might be one person on 7 and 2 makes it into the top 8. Yep. But I mean, the, the list of people on 7 and 2 is going to be as long as Very my long. arm. And my arm is long. So, it's going to be a long list. Uh, into the Rogue matchup, though. And Rogue, I think people now have accepted that Rogue is favoured in this particular matchup. Although, not so much with the secret of variety. Have they accepted that? Uh, I, I think, think so. it's. I think talk to Crane. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, there's obviously differings amongst the pro community, and it's the classic conundrum, right, of where a pro player says, 
I'm favored with the, whatever deck I'm playing, to which the answer is, of course you are, you know, your crane or whatever. Like, whatever deck he's playing with, he's probably going to be able to beat up the average pleb on ladder. Uh, but I think in these high stakes situations, personally, I'm still just a fan of the Warlock. Uh, he's able, uh, the Warlock is able to survive for such a long time, and then at the end of it all, able to get out these huge AoE, uh, these huge burst spells, sorry, with Malagos, which the Rogue is severely ill-equipped to deal with. Yeah, it's just about that early start. Like they, they can't make that huge early start. Rogue just unless he gets an Edwin, that's a huge early start that can happen. But ooh, but in general, uh, the rogue has to sort of visit, that has to go wide, put up the health minions, and just hope something sticks to play around the likes of Dark Skies. Yeah, and the uh, the questing adventure build does definitely help with that kind of strategy of just going so wide. I never lie, but I never... Okay, so just playing this down as four health on the board. No need to mess around with secrets. The warlock's not going to be really triggering many secrets or coming at you. And so just getting four points of health there is good protection for your other minions. Oh, and wow, Paradox is having none of it. So threatening. He goes with the Dark Skies right out of the gate. I've got to be honest, I am a little bit surprised by that because that is not mm -hmm. really what you're afraid of in the matchup. Secrets are kind of passive. You know, if you're the defender, secrets often don't do that much against you, to be perfectly honest. And so using one of the most powerful removal cards in your deck against just what is... You know, at the end of the day, a one for obviously they're going to be generating a lot of value, but you don't really care about them getting a lot of secrets because they are a big committal on four. However, the four health that Hanar had, if you then play, say, coin, backstab, Edwin or something, your That's dark true. skies can't clear the Edwin because the four yeah. health or what would then be a two health on the Hanar. So, Paradox ba basically said, look. I'm scared of your next thing not dying to my Dark Skies. And I have a spare Dark sky, so let's just blow it up. I really like PNC taking it a little bit slower here uh, with the uh, Dirty Tricks. Wow, okay. I was going to say he can go for Dirty Tricks Hero Power, and then he has a fairly clean-looking curve of Shield of Galakrond, and then he can go all-in on a Questing Adventurer plus she uh, Edwin turn for the biggest board possible. Uh, but instead, he's just going with a medium-sized Edwin instead of going for the full green mode. Yeah, and I think we should flash back a little bit to Paradox's previous play here. This That did allow him to kill this Edwin. Mm. Um, and still maintain his nether, bre nether breaths for when he can get full healing out of them later. So, as much as it looked weird, and I'm not going to claim it was right or wrong, because his Warlock skills yeah. are going to be better than mine, it certainly has resolved in a way that makes sense. I will act as your skin yeah, it, it, it's really close there, and it's so difficult to figure out what the different permutations would be, because obviously if you don't cast the first Dark Skies, he would have tapped instead, so he has many more cards in hand. He's looking much more likely to be able to clear off two minions with a single Dark Skies instead. Uh, whereas this way, like you said, it was safer in a certain way of looking at it, because he was guaranteed, basically, to be able to clear off anything that PNC threw down. Uh, but the downside is he's used both Dark Skies now, and is still nowhere near to... Uh, winning the board in his own right. He's still playing catch-up from behind. <laughs> yeah, these two Abyssals are going to make some headway into sorting that out. But, I don't know, Rogue's pretty good at dealing with one-off big minions. That is true, and this is no exception at all. PNC uh, needs to kind of do the uh, double-pronged attack here, where he wants to... Get some kind of a big powerful play on this turn. Probably Questing Adventure is the first thing my eye is drawn to. But also set up for Togwaggle on the following turn. You want to make sure that you have a Lackey in hand. Uh, or I suppose you could maybe get away with it being on the board. But more likely just ready to go in the hand for the following turn. So going for Backstab, Kobold, uh, and taking it out with, I suppose, the minion. Doesn't look too bad at all. Yeah, it's interesting. Somebody, and I'm not going to drop them in it, but somebody made the joke yesterday that I'm not so sure is a joke, is that we should just never tell PNC when he's being streamed. <laughs> right. Because he's so good. He's constantly up there in these tournaments. Then you, When you put him in the GM environment, it does seem like his play level drops, right? He seems to be playing absolutely yeah. fine here. I think it's very, very smart play. Getting the, I mean, I was talking about saving the Kobold Lackey. 
in hand, but with this line, he preserves the minion, still gets it on board. It's possible that Togwaggle can come down, but if it doesn't, he has strong backup play. He can still go for Kronks, he could go for Secret plus uh, the Miscreant as well. It's just very, very clean lines he's going for here that leave him in a consistently uh, ahead position. Yeah, and he's, even though Paradox has been able to deal with everything so far, he's drawn a lot of removal, he's used a lot of removal. And it looks like PNC is just going to keep forcing him to use removal for the foreseeable future. Paradox did say this morning that he was surprised how few people were doing well with Warlock in this event. He felt that Warlock was a, a good pick, obviously because he brought it, but also right. sometimes you're not sure about your brings. But he was pretty sure that Warlock was just the right thing to bring. Um, and maybe he's finding out here why not at the moment. And this is the legacy of having used both of the Dark Skies. Look how expensive this board there is. It's costing him a Moog, an unactivated Nether Breath, so he's not even healing, a Rain of Fire. His hand is getting very, very low on cards. Uh, but I suppose the fact he does have a plot twist means that soon, at least, he will be able to get that quest online and hopefully start drawing some of the power cards to actually put his own win condition on the table. Yeah. Uh, and... That is one of the good things. His win conditions will be active soon, like Zephyrus and Alex Strauss oh. and such like. But oof. Kind of a tough choice here because going uh -huh. for upgrade into a six drop is obviously completely insane here on the shield of Galakrond. But the problem is that you are then leaving a Moog Artificer in play. I wonder how big of a deal that is here. Just roll a rush minion and solve both problems. <laughs> Um, but he knows it's not active, or he knows it wasn't active last turn. So although it can still kill things, he know the healing side of it isn't necessarily as scary. Mm, Obviously, there's a true. decent chance that Paradox taps into a dragon. And I think it's not only the healing, it's also just that a lot of the spells that are good with it have been used. Double Dark Skies, mm -hmm. Rain of Fire, Nether Breath. There's only like another Nether Breath and another Rain of Fire that are even like that good with it at all, to be honest. Bit worrying there that PNC thought for so long about whether to play the other lackey, but I'm sure he had his reasons. And I'd rather people think for too long than too short. But yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's just tog waggle, right? It's ha how you want to go about positioning that because at this stage in the game, where you've already missed the turn six and the turn seven tog waggle, you at least have to consider that maybe you're waiting for a turn ten where you can do it all right. in one turn with the wand included. Uh, but I think in this situation, he's very possibly just looking at going for it next turn, and uh, at the very least, it leaves his options more open. No, that's a really good point. I'd assumed he would just auto go for it next turn, but you're right. He could have gone for Dragon, yeah. had a turn 8 Dra um, Kronk, then played turn 9 Galakron, and then gone on right. Togwaggly after that. Yeah, that would make sense too. Okay, there is the Galakron. So, PNC is definitely, I would imagine, looking to go for the Togwaggle first, because that's the sequence that generally you want to approach that, where you draw your Invoke cards, and then you go for the Galakron. But with the prep off the top, Neil, he could go for it on this very turn. That is a huge oh. draw. Oh my goodness. Bing. The only reason not to that I can see is if you want to get the flick down on the Aranasi because it then deletes that potential healing from the deck later on, which is tempting for sure. But can it really be better than a wand on this turn? And that's the question. He's, like, he's got to get on with it. If he's going to wand this right. turn, you want to have some time left to actually use the fruits of the wand. <laughs> I'm sure is some Indeed. horrible meme or something. <laughs> like, you've got to go for it, like, now. It's too late. Right now. You, you can't go for it now. Hmm. Yep. Agreed. And while I think Flick is, is a fine play on this, uh, you know, the, the upsides are very clear because you potentially delete a card from your opponent's hand, or at the very least, delete some of the best draws from their deck. But the downside is that he's going to have a much, much lower turn next time next turn, sorry, than he would have otherwise had. And now we get to the point of the game where the Warlock starts to face lethal every single turn and has to take Whoa. increasingly more ridiculous risks, but... Wow. That is a huge draw for Paradox to be able to clear things up here and get his own minion on the board and start counter-pressuring the Rogue.
Like, Zero Mana Nether is pretty much always the nuts, apart from Maligos, obviously, as a closer. Yeah. It's just the way you get on the board. Like, if you don't like Zero Mana Nethers, you are insane. All right, it was a close decision for PNC last turn. Now, I'm thinking it's nice and easy. Uh, even the Dragon Queen Alex Straza, I don't hate for a later point in the game. Yeah, you're quite likely to get it active in the next turn or two. Yeah, he has no reason to believe he's anywhere near dead. He's seen the one Nought Mana card, which I'm sure he was really happy with. Yeah, that's fair. And this time, he's obviously going straight for the Togwaggle. No messing around. Going to have the maximum time to consider what to do here. Okay, Seal plus the Waste Warden. The card we're not seeing in uh, many of the lists. I think it was before playing it yesterday. Yeah, he, he had it. Um, but pretty good here, just as a way to deal that little bit of extra damage. Make sure that the Rogue is tanking nothing, because what do you like to I don't think he likes to being dead on this turn. He does realize he's got to try and slow down on the damage. That is where things get scary, is if you tank the performance. Yeah, and it's a big difference between 18 and 20. That's literally two hits instead of three mm -hmm. um, from Soulfires. So the breakpoints aren't as discreet as in some matchups because, yeah, cards like Netherwing exist and mess right. around with them. But if you can keep yourself above 18, that is a rule of thumb that is not a bad one, at least for starters. So, uh, I mean, there's a couple of options now for Paradox. Trade Netherwing, Netherwing is at the very least play the consider. We've put him down to nine, which is scary for sure, but you are unlikely to be dead uh, at that point. Yeah, and actually I quite like how he's done this. He's set up some sort of board. And, oh, he's <laughs> going for it. The imp is the difference between um, putting your opponent on nine or not. Uh, yeah, sure. That's right, actually, yeah. So Soulfire off the top now could actually just be lethal. It's a good spot. In some worlds, and... yeah. You know, the top players always say, try and set up lethals. doesn't matter how unlikely they are. And no other use for the card. Why not set up a lethal? Yeah. So obviously the Dragon Queen not active quite yet. Two more activations needed on Galakrond. So I think for PNC, we're probably looking at just a Galakrond on this turn. You know, you can go for the shield on this turn and hope to top deck another invoke on the next turn. Or you can just get the Galakrond down now. Get your Kronks online. Uh, because the game is ending soon. You know, the Dragon Queen Alex Straza from Paradox's side, which PNC knows is there, is only going to be like two or three turns max from being activated. I think this is smart. Dark in the sky. Yep. <laughs> you, you do a whole heap of analysis, and I just go, yep. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so yeah. No <laughs> surprise, silly soul fire lethal from... <laughs> from the realms of the impossible. Yeah, not quite. I mean, it's a good thing that you're you're keeping track of that because that is always what you have to be aware of the Warlock deck. Looking unlikely now that Paradox will be able to go for a true Ocean Cave. 21 health, even two damage spells would not be able to get there for him, along with Malagos. And with now both Nether Breaths gone, a Rain of Fire gone, uh, Soul Fire as the, uh, the last remaining Bastion of hope in terms of damage. Or, of course, he could just tap into Zero Mana Maui. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's what he seems to be trying to set up. Mm. So is there a lethal available? Uh, very incredibly unlikely one, I think, but no. Misses the oh, Maui. Oh, yikes. That's better, well, okay. It doesn't, it's not active, but it's something. It's not active yet, but, you know, already we're looking at the potential of if there's a big board from PNC, Zephyrus, Twisting Nether, Dragon Queen and Alex Straza all on one turn to shift the tides of battle and put PNC on the back foot for really the first time this game. Yeah, and Rogue does not like cleaning up a board of three big dragons if that's oh, what no. happens with the Alex Straza. Yeah, not at all. Uh, especially when they're backed up with some sort of Zephyrus help. It's going to have to be very soon indeed, though, if that does come down for Paradox, because already for PNC, there's 14 damage on this turn, if you wanted to go with the, the good old Kronk step. Yeah, 
yeah, that's going to be dangerous. Just to point out, though, let's assume that Paradox only has one pair of cards left in his deck that's messing up the Highlander effect. Yeah. That means he has a two in five chance of next turn drawing it, and that's a likely situation. Be very unlucky to have two pairs. Left right. Left the deck. So one thing Master happening next turn. is, uh, sorry to cut you off there, very interesting, though, because being able to get more combo cards, there's some pretty good ones that he could hit. And Hook Scimitar is undeniably one of them. That is a very premium card to get here when you're just trying to kill your opponent. And he is trying to kill his opponent. I imagine he won't replay the Kronks. There's no need. He can buff yeah. his board next turn. And if the board's there next turn, he wins. Oh, he, there it is. <laughs> so fire. That's the last duplicate. And now, I mean, as I was saying, as a base level, if you can't find anything better, Zephyrus clear Dragon Queen Alexstrasza, obviously only leaving a 1-1 one, one on the other side, is a huge swing. Must destroy. Yeah, it certainly is. It certainly is. And the damage from hand will be huge, because we know there's another soul fire in there. We hadn't checked the list, but there's obviously another one. So he can draw his entire deck, basically. Oh, he's going to just leave it out there! I thought he might Zephyrus it, but he's just going this route. Okay, getting the Malagoth down instead. It means he's taking more damage. And unless this Dragon Queen Alex Strasser now offers him healing or taunt, he is simply going to die on the backswing. He calculated it as best as he could, saying it's unlikely that PNC has the extra damage to clear. But because of his decision to go for it this way, it does mean sadly the six damage that was dealt to him as well as PNC hooked Scimitar off of the world Darug. master. If he played the dragon first and got the zero Malagos, was that a lethal? Because uh, then he could have Zephyrus for the rest of the damage. Uh, well, I mean, I'm had... not saying this was correct. He, he, the way he did it was right. Yeah. Well, he uh, had a zero I, mana I... Alex into a zero mana Malagos into Soulfire Zephyrus yeah. and a tap. Unfortunate. That's the sort of thing that Paradox will be very upset about. Zero mana Malagos, and then, yeah, I think it might have been just about lethal, actually, you're right. Tap into the other Soul uh, Fire and you definitely get it, it's easy. Well, but he had PNC... Rain, of, Rain of Fire plus Zephyrus plus Soul Fire, yeah. like I said. It, it was a long way to go about it, but uh, I think Paradox gave himself arguably the best chance possible. The only other uh, argument you could make was for Zephyrus on that turn to clear the board, but uh, you can't really play around the Scimitar from your opponent. No, definitely not. Uh, it's just very unfortunate. So now we get into two more players that we see reasonable amounts of, um, especially um, High Three, who's had decent results. He got nine wins in Seoul and six wins in LA, and has a chance of still doing the Grandmaster thing. Mm -hmm. in the shadows. And just give me one moment. Yeah, uh, Kylin S is the other member of RNG who you probably haven't heard of, the other two being Lee and Lise. Yes. And Lise is a player I think is extremely good to watch out for. But Kylin is the other player. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I casted Kylin's a while ago at the Gold Club World mm -hmm. Championship, which is one of the first big tournaments I ever did. Uh, and I mean, I seem to remember him playing fairly well. I think that RNG was not one of the uh, stronger teams that we had there at the time. Uh, but some of the decks he definitely understood very, very well. And uh, I'm glad to see that he's still uh, still going in the competitive heart zone scene and doing very well for that matter, too. Yeah, I don't know if it holds 100%, but if your other two members of the team are Lee and Lee, you're... there's probably a lot of strong competition for that third spot, right? So you're probably yeah. pretty good, just just by logical extrapolation. It doesn't necessarily hold, but I quite like it. Give me a quest. Uh, Rogue against Warlock does seem to be... I, I talked about Warrior versus Demon Hunter being the defining matchup of the meta, but that's in the like the ladder meta. Yeah. This might be the defining matchup of this particular tournament. Yeah, and you're always going to have a different kind uh, of defining matchups in tournament methods, right? Like, one of them is going to be the top two decks against each other, or the top two or three decks. One of them is going to be the decks that you have to put in your lineup in order to get over the finish line. Rogue and Warlock are, I think no one would argue, anymore at least, that these are, either of these two decks are the best deck in the game when you have Warrior and Demon Hunter rolling around. Right. Uh, but, the, you know, you still have to get a win with them to win with your Conquest lineup, and uh, it takes creative play with either deck to do so. Perfectly shown here, 
by Kylin's already just throwing out the questing adventurer. This is something we're seeing more and more, where you don't try and set up for the biggest possible turn in one fell swoop. You just get it on the board and hope that it gets the job done, and a lot of the time, it does. Yeah, I mean, backstab, eviscerate on the Doomsayer, and your questing cool. gets super large. It's just the first thing that catches the eye here. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's just doing it in the right order in case he gets some horrible roll yeah. off the face. Listen, we've all rolled Doomsayer there. I mean, really sad. Yeah, exactly. Sadly, they don't cancel each other out. I'm getting a 2-3 is actually a decent-sized deal there as well. And it means that um, High 3 will only have nine cards before he taps That's next right. turn. Yeah, it's a huge deal, actually, playing around the potential of a Dark Skies on the following turn. It was a very clean turn by Kylins. The only thing I think he was trying to fit in was potentially getting the seal fate on that turn, so he has a lackey in hand to go for Faceless Corruptor. Uh, but even having said that, he's still very likely uh, to get it down just on the lackey on board at the moment. And, and the problem here is he just wins next turn if this isn't dealt with. He does. Uh, even with Thalnos coin into the nether breath, still doesn't get the job done for high three. I can only actually see like 11 or 12 damage or something, but I'm sure he wins next turn because that's how numbers usually end up working. I mean, he can just seal a fate his own face, right? Or seal yeah, a fate. He'll seal find, a fate. He'll well done. Oh, Cast a bingo, everybody. That's why <laughs> it exists. But yeah, the problem here is not that High 3 can't survive, it's that what does he do after he survives? giving himself the absolute max. Yeah, just giving yourself draws to pull it back next turn. You know, we're looking at uh, Dark Sky, Kray's Netherwing, uh, probably not Mortal <laughs> Coil because you're fully expecting to die before then. Excuse me, the cackling, but the Shadow Step allows this questing to get so much bigger. Yeah, so you're sealed fate that first. Hope to hit the Cobalt Lackey. Not ideal. Yeah, Titanic would also have been quite nice on this occasion. Yeah, true. Hit some damage into face, then you shadow step this and just keep playing cards. Unless you want to steal fate the other thing, but yeah, I mean, all you, need cards. To, all you need to do here, I think, one hundred percent, is get it above three health and ideally above four uh, as well, actually, because then that plays around Netherwing plus Rain of Fire or Netherwing plus ooh, Netherwing plus Mortal Coil, and if you can get that as well to go along with it, you are feeling great as Kylie. Thank. Just take the cheapest thing. Stop. Uh, I understand, it's here. actually, it's damage to the face if things go wrong. Uh, if, if I had to snap pick that, I also would have gone for the uh, Twilight Drake. Even though it's going to be a 4-4, four, four, I don't care. It's just a thing I can put on the board next to yep. But yeah, now, Isira is damage. Whatever. Yeah, absolute last chance now for High 3 to turn this around and... Uh, Double Craze Netherwing is not the card he's looking for, even with Tap or Sense Demon, however you want to go about it. This isn't the one. Game 4 is where he has to try and get his chance to turn this around up against Island and uh, just kind of getting into the player's mindsets here. Going into Day 2, it's the first match of the day at 4-1. Uh, I almost feel like the pressure must be higher now for them than it was at the start of the tournament when the anticipation yeah. is just setting in because you're doing very well. You know, you're you're know, you allowing your hopes to be got, gotten up at this point in the series. There's a chance you could actually go all the way. But if you lose once more, you are almost guaranteed to be out of contention for top eight. It's very scary yes. stuff. <laughs> That's right. You go to bed at 4-1, and one, job done. And then you wake up, now you've got to go 4-0, and oh, which is even better on the second day. That's insane. And yeah, you're right. That's the day where you don't sleep. The first day, it's like, okay, well, nine rounds of Swiss. I've got to win eight of them. Realistically, there's 350 players I've got to beat to get there. Probably yep. not going to happen unless you're a crazy Frenchman. <laughs> but... When you wake up on this day, it's like, okay, well, this is a thing that I can now see how it works. And like you say, I wonder, some of these players must sleep pretty badly overnight, I think. I've mean, been seeing that from a lot of the players talk on social media that, uh, you know, whether or not they consciously admit it to themselves, I think the nerves are very real for even the biggest players. You know, even not competing in this tournament myself, 
you know, up the night before, it, it felt like the day before Christmas to me, like when you're a child. I was so excited and I could just feel the tension from all of the players who have been working so, so hard to get to this point. You only get six shots in a year if you even qualify through to all of those. It's not a lot. Yeah, and it's um, a lot of, it's like the chance they get to show themselves, isn't it? Like you say, it's they've worked really hard to get here. A lot of these players grind a lot of qualifiers lot. to just get into this spot. Um, you know, no matter how good you are, winning a, a thousand player qualifier is not easy. Um, going top 60 on ladder is also not easy, or we'd all be doing it, apart from the 16 who do do it. So, yeah, they, they just want their chance to show off, and you don't get that chance to show off unless either you get lucky, if you like, in round one and get paired mm -hmm. with somebody else who's quite well known, or you get to four and one, where we get to show pretty much everybody at this point. Highland's you going get more with chance to show that you're good. Yeah, exactly. And this is the chance for these players, neither of whom are at least to the uh, you know the English speaking scene. I think especially well known. A good way to get your name on the table and potentially uh, for High Three get himself into Grand Masters as well to really get his name out there. And if he was looking to do so, this is where I think his heart has really got to be beating Neil. He's seeing ramp into ramp into Mount Cellar. This is close to the absolute nightmare for High 3. Incredibly difficult to deal with this board. And after he goes with crazy Netherwing that clears literally nothing, Kylans can just laugh all the way to the bank with this hand. Yep, nowhere near twisting Netherland and loads of little spells he can play to draw more oh. things. More cards. More porcupines. Cards. More cards. Yeah. More beasts. Everything. And now you start getting your backup plan in place just in case. You don't. You just kill them next turn. That's the backup plan. Kill them this turn or kill them next turn. Whoa. It's going to have to be an incredibly robust answer from High 3 to be able to pull back to this one. And for the second tournament in a row, we're seeing a lot of the Chinese players who are able to play. They don't often get the chance to travel mm -hmm. to a lot of the events. They're able to play these Masters Tours, showing just how good they are and how well they're doing. Uh, we've had several top eights online from Chinese players already. Yeah, I think the region at this point, the, you know, as I was saying, it, it is the most insular of the regions uh, due to, you know, different scenes, language barriers, whatever it may be. But when we do get a glimpse into them, you know, even just with the most obvious example being uh, with Lion taking the entire global finals last year, I think we get a glimpse of who, how strong of a region they truly are. Yeah. I mean, having said that, you know, Thailand just threw the ramp in this game. <laughs> no, no, but only... I, just, I just mean in general, he's five and yes. one. Yeah, not this Druid. Yeah, you're right. This particular game of Hearthstone, there's 5,000 people in the world can play this game of Hearthstone, this exact one. Yeah. But you've got to get to the tournament. You've got to go five and one to be as good as oh, Thailand's. Yes. And not many people have done that. that. That's where I was going. Yes, you're absolutely right. This exact game isn't necessarily showing off his skill. Very nicely done as well, realizing that the weakness of Warlock is very often the soul of the forest. So much that some of the Japanese players at the uh, final week of Grandmasters were putting in double soul of the forest into their uh, Druid build. A uh, inclusion I wasn't personally very fond of. It seemed like even with that inclusion, you were making yourself weaker to the Warlock by cutting your Sarah. But when you get it down on nine mana with uh, the full board of Glowflies, there is little to nothing that the Warlock can do, and I think this is just lights out now, now for High 3. Yeah, I'd actually written it off already, but this time I think you're right. Um, it's very hard to tune a Druid because you've got to factor in... There's some games you can't win. Mm -hmm. There's some games that you can't get wrong. So you've only, you're only tuning for the weird sort of middle ground, which isn't that many games. Mm. You're only tuning for the games where the Warlock survives the first wave and then the game moves on. Yeah. And in general, that isn't that many games. Because either you're just stuffed as a druid by that point or you've killed them. Exactly. And I mean, this is why it's so important to look at players uh, win rate over a large sample size when we... Uh... Uh, saw the most recent stats about who had the highest win percentages over all the open qualifiers, and I think Orin was number one uh, over all of those, and it was like Penadani was very, very high up there as well. Uh, you know, it, it shows those players have tremendous amount of consistency and understand the matchups very well, because when you filter out the games you just can't win, 
you are left with uh, a good representation of your overall win rate. And while my heart goes out to high three here, I think he did uh, everything he could in that particular last game in order to try and turn things around. But it is RNG Violence here, another one of the very, very strong Chinese players, showing his stuff that he, uh, him and his region that he represents deserve a lot more attention in uh, the Western Hearthstone community. Indeed, and that's pretty much round six. They're getting a lot more attention for the Chinese players, I suspect, for round seven, eight, and nine, the way they are doing. Uh, I just want to look back to the very first game, your first match we saw of the day. Mm. You talk about those qualifier stats, and shout out to Donkey, who is the master <laughs> of the stats at the current yes. moment in time. Um, Give Please is fifth if you filter by 100 really? or more, with 66.8%. That is so, impressive. No surprise to see him up here getting his third good Masters Tour and also in fifth place on win percentage for 2020 qualifiers. So let's see how he gets on later in the day. But that's round six all wrapped up. We're getting really close to finding out at least one or two Grand Masters by the end of the day. So stay tuned. We'll be back round seven in just a moment. 